थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग हेलो एंड वॉर्म प्रिंसिपल टू दर्टी एथ से ऑर्थोपेडिक एक्टिव लर्निंग सेशन आई एम धीरेन कंजवाला द कोर्डिनेटर फॉर दिस सेशन द एम ऑफ दिस सेशन इज टू इन्वाइट एमिनेंट एक्सपर्ट ऑफ पीडियाट्रिक ऑर्थोपेडिक so that our fellows not only from india but the adjacent country also they can broaden their thinking the topic for today's session is very unique and very new and that's a spino pelvic alignment following surgery over children with cerebral palsy and the expert is who is really passionate about this topic is dr paulo selber Dr Paulo Salber at present is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Hospital for Special Service in New York to give you the brief background about this the doctor Paulo Salber is known for his two major contribution in the field of cerebral palsy in 2000 he first described the distal femoral extension osteotomy and patellar plication surgery which at that point was completely new and now we know that that surgery has become a very routine in the armamentarium of uh, surgeons who are dealing with children with cerebral palsy and the second his contribution which become popular when he was at uh, melbourne for i think 15 years he practiced at uh, royal children hospital melbourne and at that point he came uh, out with the idea of transferring the semi tendinosus to adductor magnus and the reason for that surgery is the power of the hamstrings is not lost and that does not result into the anterior pelvic tilt so these concept which uh, dr paulo sarbar is going to share with us is completely a new concept and i am sure that we all are going to learn from that new concept so with that short introduction now i hand over to Dr. Paolo, over to you. Uh, good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, um, it's good morning here in in New York. Uh, thank you, Diren, for this kind invitation to present this new um, concept. It's actually a new concept in the world of ambulatory cerebral palsy. Of course, it's not new in the world of uh, spine um, uh, spine surgery. in spine uh, surgeons they've been studying um, spinal pelvic alignment for at least 40 years and there are hundreds um, if not thousands of publications uh, regarding the matter so um these are my my mentors the people who taught me uh, most of what i know dr ivan ferreto in in brazil dr luciano dias in chicago and dr jim gage in uh minnesota and i owe them uh, uh my my little expertise in 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 this field you know we just sit on their shoulders that's pretty much it uh so uh i'm going to talk as as jaren said uh, about sp spine pelvic alignment uh for non spine cp surgeons this is how i see it okay i have no conflict of interest Uh, but why talk about SPA spinal pelvic alignment if I'm not an expert if if uh, if I'm not uh, a spine surgeon? Uh, for those who are attached to Star Wars, uh, it's because this is the way. I think this is the way ahead. This is the way that we will have to learn to treat gait uh, better and more efficiently, not only for the first twenty years of life of these patients, but for the rest of their lives. So this is all based on this principle uh, that we believe that anterior pelvic tilt is not a good deal for for these patients. And uh, uh, Dr. Jim Gage taught me that when I was a fellow in Minnesota in 1995, and told me leave the hamstrings alone, and uh, and try and spare um, the hamstrings. And if it, it was Dr. Jim Gage who taught. me the semi tendinosus transfer which is uh, you know a means it's not panacea it doesn't solve all of our problems of flex knee gait but at least it improves knee extension without compromising the pelvis and the sagittal plane too much unlike this poor kid that has had hamstring lengthenings or too much so in 
in five minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the human spine evolved over the last four and a half million years. Well, it evolved because we needed and wanted to stand up straighter. And we needed to be efficient to survive in the world then. So this is more or less, and you've all seen this, uh, this picture, and this is more or less how, how it happened. And it happened for, it took us about four and a half, five million years to get the spine where you and I have it. Darwin, Darwin thought that it was because the, the climate had changed and our uh, ancestors had to move from the trees to savanna. But now we know that it's not quite like that. It's because already then the, the, the pre-humans of that time had diverse habitats and needed to survive in different habitats. That's why we needed to change. But to change, we also needed to be efficient. And to be efficient in terms of, uh, of gait and running, we need to uh, decrease the amount of muscles that we had. And to decrease the amount of muscles that we had, we needed to bring the center of gravity or the center of mass from the front of the base of support to the top of the base of support. So, but this is how we were. We, we, uh, we started with very narrow, long, thin, anteriorly tilted pelvis. And with the loading being applied uh, anteriorly to the uh, base of support. And we needed to improve that if we wanted to be uh, upright and straight and, and effective in running and climbing trees and, and escaping and, and harvesting food for our, for our kids then. So this is the chimpanzee uh, structure of the pelvis and, and lumbar, uh, lumbar spine. And you can see that it's a very long and narrow uh, pelvis. And it has at least two of the four lumbar vertebras stuck within the, the, the iliac and wings. And uh, therefore, this is a very stiff construction. And the, the lumbar spine in those animals, it doesn't move much at all. So we added another uh, fifth uh, lumbar vertebra. And we made our pelvis uh, shorter and wider, uh, and if you compare to the uh, to the chimpanzee, that's those are the the classic differences that we see. So one very important concept there is that one of the vertebrae uh, L four got extruded from out of the pelvis, therefore giving us uh, more mobility at the uh, bottom of the the, the spine. So our pelvis also uh, widened and thickened because as babies, we have big, big, big heads. You know, orthopedic surgeons do have big heads as well. I don't know if they have the brains inside, but the big head uh, is there. Uh, but we needed uh, to change the pelvis to, so that these big head passed through during birth. So we wanted to be upright. We needed to be economic. We had instinct and we started to becoming smarter, but we needed to be flexible and agile because we needed to grab stuff from the floor, carry on our arms and hands to take back home, but we also needed to be uh, able to run as fast and perhaps climb up to trees at the same time to escape the predators. So, what did we do then? Well, we adopted the, lor the lumbar lordosis. We came from a very straight spine tilted forward, and we, we curved our lumbar spine backwards. And this is what we call, and everybody knows that, the lumbar lordosis. And with uh, uh, tilting the lumbar lordosis, uh, we also started using the posterior elements in, uh, as, as base of support. So we started distributing the load, not only over the vertebral bodies, but also over the posterior elements. And what happened is lumbar lordosis brought 
the center, the, the loading or the center of mass back closer to the spine. And this allowed us to streamline the musculature that we have controlling uh, the, the lumbar spine. You can see that on the uh, on the chimpanzee, the the I put a a coil there, a spring, and the, it's a very thin, uh, very thick, because it's constantly trying to pull the trunk backwards. But when you have the construction that we have, then these muscles can be slimmed down; they can be trimmed down, and therefore uh, having smaller muscles, we save energy. So. This is more or less what we have nowadays. We have uh, uh, the loading, the vertical loading uh, passing close or at the, the, the lumbar lordosis. So not by coincidence then that when you see the cross-sectional uh, area of musculature, the perivertebrae muscles of the, the monkeys, for instance, in the modern humans, we have way much more muscles in our back or way much less muscles in, in our back, which goes in line with the concept of uh, energy conservation. So why, why studying these things? Why did I decide to study these things? You know, I, uh, people who want to do lower limb surgery are those people that don't like the spine. You know, I remember, all I remembered uh, of the spine until I started reading about it was that it was that big bone behind the heart. And, you know, I was interested in kinematics and kinetics of the hips, knees, and, and, and feet and, and ankle. But the problem is that I was treating, uh, and I am still treating patients with neuromuscular disorders, a lot of cerebral palsy. And, of course, the legs are just the, the, the carrier to the passenger, and the passenger is the trunk. And the trunk has an upright position thanks to the, 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 the spine shape and curvatures. So I, I wanted to learn about it because I think, you know, it took us four and a half million years to develop the spine that we have. And I suspect that most of the, 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 the gait treatments that I see around the world for pathological gait, they completely ignore the passenger, the, the lumbar spine. And proof of that is that people continue to do hamstrings lengthenings to uh, persons with cerebral palsy that have flexed knee gait. And sure enough, hamstrings are part, a very crucial part of keeping the pelvis and the sagittal plane aligned uh, and, and preventing it from tilting uh, forward. And we know, and there are papers showing, and quite a few papers showing that when we lengthen the hamstrings, one of the consequences very often, not in all cases, but very often, is that the pelvis tilts forward. So about 10 years ago, uh, Jim Gage, Kirk Graham, and I wrote a letter to an editor regarding a very uh, specific paper where the authors uh, compared semitendinosis transfers with uh, uh, gracilis transfers, semimembranoses, and biceps lengthenings to hamstrings lengthenings alone. And sure enough, they did not see any uh, any uh, preservation of the pelvis with the first group. And when we saw that paper, we wrote a letter saying, well, I think we well, you overdosed the hamstrings because you were transferring semi-T, but you were also transferring gracilis. You were also lengthening semimembranoses, and in some cases, even lengthening biceps femoris as well. No wonder the pelvis tilted in both groups. And on their reply, they said, well, if the femur becomes more vertical by correcting the flex to knee gait, then the pelvis must tilt forward. Well, this is how I see it. Uh, living on that body with a pelvic tilt is, living like, uh, is like living on that building. Who, I can't see you all, but tell me who of you would like to live in that building? Uh, that I put on, on your right. And that's exactly what's happening to that adult that we, thanks to EOS, we can measure the spine, we can measure spinal alignment and the lower limbs. This is a patient who had hamstrings lengthenings 30 years prior to this 
these uh, these these uh, X rays, and that's how uh, his alignment is, or her alignment is, and um, and this is how I I see these patients. This is how Dr. Jim Gage taught me to see these patients. That's why I don't believe that when the the, the femur becomes more vertical, the pelvis has to tilt forward. I think when the, the femur becomes more vertical, the pelvis tilts forward because we are damaging 40% of the hip extensor power in, in humans that comes from the hamstrings. So this is, we measured the, the pelvic tilt on this patient and it's 35 degrees anteriorly tilted. So it took us four and a half million years to get up straight with the pelvis tilted between five and 10 degrees anteriorly and to get a spine straight and aligned. And what do we do with our hamstrings lengthenings? In my opinion, we're, we're just sending back four and a half million years our, our patients. The problem is that a lot of the, the doctors who uh, treat this patient are the pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And most of them, unlike me, don't see the adults. The reason why I started seeing adults was because even back at, in Brazil, where I started my career, my mentor there, Dr. Ivan Ferreto, told me, you need to learn how to treat the adults because cerebral palsy doesn't go away when they turn 18, duh. Well, uh, I didn't want to be an adult uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon. I wanted to be a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. But those words were very powerful in my little head. And I, I I started seeing the adults even from AACD. And then in Melbourne, I continued to see them and I continued to see them here. So that's given me the opportunity to see what most pediatric orthopedic surgeons don't see, will never experience, which is actually the consequences of their our surgeries in the very long term. So... When I, I have been talking about avoid hamstrings lengthenings for uh, since the mid 90s when Dr. Jim Gage taught me that. And we, we, we published about the semitendinosus transfer. And we basically, I basically have been saying, look, it doesn't solve all of our problems, but you start with semi T transfer. If that's not enough, you do an anterior hemipipsidesis of the distal knee. And if that's not enough, uh, you do a supracondylar extension osteotomy and, and, and patellar shortening, but don't lengthen the other hamstrings. This is our concept of dosing, surgical dosing, which is something that we started a long time ago. You know, you need to give uh, 500 milligrams of Tylenol, 500 mil milligrams of Tylenol and, and uh, ibuprofen. And if that's not enough, you give a more powerful non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So with surgery, it's the same. So when after I'm getting close to the, the end of my career and I look around and I see that people continue to get the hamstrings lengthenings everywhere. And uh, I continue to see even kids here in New York, you know, after three or four or five years of hamstrings lengthenings, and they all have the anterior pelvic tilt which is dreadful to me. And, and it looks like nothing is changing. So that's when I decided, I said, well, this is not right. There's got to be a way to explain to, to pediatric orthopedic surgeons that what they're doing to these patients is not right. And I started learning and studying uh, the spine against my, my principles because I never wanted to learn about the spine, but I, I had to. And the spinal pelvic alignment came as a bomb to my uh, brain because it is very, very well correlated with quality of life. So this has been very well documented. So this is one of the little, the first little studies that we uh, we have done uh, uh, using gait analysis and pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis mismatch in patients with cerebral palsy that we had the, the opportunity to present here in the United States in a couple of meetings. And I'm going to use this paper to illustrate what SPA means in, in uh, ambulatory cerebral palsy. And of course, I would love to uh, acknowledge my, my co-authors that... Uh, 
that helped me uh, put this together. So SPA is the spatial relationship between the trunk, pelvis, and lower extremities and in the sagittal plane. So this has been measured for more than 40 years. It's new to the gait analysts and to the gait uh, people, but it's very old in spine surgery. And more recently, it has been discovered by the hip surgeons and the, the total hip replacers. So it, it assesses the global alignment, the balance and the posture, as well as the gait that these patients uh, may may have. So it's it's the opposite way to see things. We see things from the foot up in the gate lab. These uh, these concepts see the patients how do they how do they position their lower limbs to compensate for what's going on up on the passenger or or the trunk. There are multiple measurements and it includes pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, sacral slope, lumbar lordosis. So you know all of them except pelvic incidence. Perhaps the fellows know, but uh, the, I submit to you that most of the gait analysts in the, in the group that are watching this don't know very much about pelvic incidence. So it's all based on, on uh, the first concept uh, from uh, Dr. Jean uh, Dubousset, where he talked about the cone of efficiency that we all study where when we're in uh, re orthopedic residency. So the cone of e efficiency is this cone with the base up, which, which establishes where can the trunk be in relation to the base of support. And the further away the trunk is from the base of support, the more muscle activity you, you, you are required to activate to keep yourself from falling forward or backwards or to the sides. So, so it's important to remember that the more the trunk deviates to one side or the other, back or, uh, back or, or forward and to the sides, the more muscle activity is required to keep balance. So pelvic tilt. Is pelvic tilt important? Yes, it is, because pelvic tilt is directly correlated with lumbar lordosis. The more anterior or posterior pelvic tilt you have, the more or less lordosis or compensatory lordosis you must have. And it's simple. L5 is attached to S1 very solidly. So if the pelvis tilts forward, it carries with, uh, with it the, the lumbar uh, spine. And to stay within the cone of economy or efficiency, you need to increase the lordosis when you tilt the pelvis forwards. Otherwise, you fall forward. So now pelvic incidence. Um, I, I think I was born again when I discovered pelvic incidence because that's exactly what I needed to know to push this concept ahead. And it, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was described uh, about 50 years ago, 40 years ago by Dr. Um, uh, oh, I forgot his name now. But anyway, pelvic, pelvic incidence is the angle which is measured from a perpendicular line to, to the sacrum. Okay, can you see my pointer? I think you can. This perpendicular line, it is at the very center of S1. And the line that connects the center of the femoral head. So this angle here is pelvic incidence. And pelvic incidence is like your, your pelvic um, uh, fingerprint. Every one of us has a different pelvic incidence. It changes as we um, mature during adolescence, and it, it increases during uh, adolescence. But once you stop growing, pelvic incidence stays, remains. It doesn't change anymore. And that's very important because if pelvic tilt changes, Pelvic incidence does not change. It continues. Sacral slope also 
does not change in relation to pelvic incidence, but it does change in relation to the space we're in. So the more pelvic tilt we have, the more the sacral slope change in relation to the horizontal line. And lumbar lordosis, we all know it's measured from L1 to the top of L1 to uh, uh, the sacrum, and it changes. You can have, uh, you have everybody has a typical uh, lordosis, but we can change it to more or less because there's flexibility in lumbar, uh, in the lumbar spine. So the more anterior pelvic tilt you have, the, the greater the sacral slope, and consequently, the more lordosis you have. So then comes the concept of uh, spine, uh, spinal pelvic al alignment match or mismatch. And this is the great takeover from our colleague spine uh, surgeons who investigated it a long time ago. So it's been discovered that lumbar lordosis is always proportional to pelvic incidence. And it should be within, it started as nine or 10 degrees, but nowadays people talk about 14 or 15 degrees and it increases as we age. But the, the amount of lor, lumbar lordosis is relatively fixed in terms or in relation to pelvic incidence. So you have match like in these cases where pelvic incidence is 30 and the difference between uh, pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis is only five degrees. So you're matched. Uh, 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 the, uh, even if you have increased pelvic incidence on your right example, lumbar lordosis is 65. So the difference again is within five degrees. So it's, it's a match. The problem is, as I said, I said pelvic incidence doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't change. Imagine on the example of the left side, pelvic incidence is 30 degrees, but now lumbar lordosis is 55 degrees. There is a difference of 25 degrees. This is what we call uh, pelvic incidence uh, lumbar lordosis mismatch. And this is how people age. This is how people compensate normally for uh, the, the progressive loss of lumbar lordosis that we all present and how we accommodate pelvic incidence and pelvic tilt in re relation to loss of uh, lumbar lordosis. I'm not gonna go into a lot, of, a lot of details here, but you can see that depending on the compensation, we can hyperextend the knees or when we have a posteriorization of the, the spine and loss of lumbar uh, lordosis, we, can, we have to flex the knee to keep the uh, center of uh, gravity or center of mass relatively well balanced. So what did we do as one of our, uh, uh, one of our first little papers in, uh, to try and understand uh, uh, pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis mismatch? So we measured SPA in a whole bunch of patients who have had gait analysis with and with uh, without hamstrings lengthenings and pelvic uh, alterations. So we collected gait analysis between 2020 and 2022. Uh, this was uh, retrospectively analyzed. Uh, we excluded patients that had any um, uh, spinal implants or uh, radio, um, radiology that was older than six months. And we calculated the ideal lumbar lordosis that the patients have or should have using uh, this formula from Hume and co-authors and through this formula here. So we collected gait analysis in the normal way, more than six trials. Um, we measured the difference between uh, PI and lumbar lordosis between uh, um, uh, uh, smaller than 10 degrees or uh, greater than 10, minus 10 degrees. So anything that was not within these values were, was, call, was called mismatch. And we also measured pelvic and trunk uh, tilt through gait analysis. So what we found, and this is very interesting, we found that patients who had less knee flexion deformity 
because they had uh, they had uh, hamstrings lengthenings or whatever, mostly hamstrings lengthenings. They uh, walked with less uh, knee flexion, and uh, but they they had uh, a greater incidence of this of mismatch. And patients who who walked with more, more knee flexion had less mismatch. And I know that at first this is hard to understand, but basically when you lengthen hamstrings and you extend your patient's knees, when the pelvis tilts forward, it create it increases lordosis and that produces mismatch. When patients walk with more knee flexion, the lordosis is not so increased and therefore there is not so much mismatch. So in hemiplegia was the opposite. Patients with mismatch had more knee flexion and pa patients with no mismatch has had less knee flexion. And I can honestly tell you that we haven't understood the reason for that yet. Probably because the, the contralateral typical side was balancing the pelvis, but we're still trying to understand these results. So uh, again, the, the difference between the predicted lumbar lordosis or the lumbar lordosis that the patient should have in relation to their uh, pelvic incidence was greater in patients with mismatch than in patients with no mismatch. So basically we knew pelvic incidence for all the, the group, Based on the pelvic incidence, we can calculate what is the ideal lumbar lordosis for these patients so that they're not in the realm of uh, mismatch. And uh, what happened was that patients that had uh, 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 they, they had mismatched, uh, obviously they had greater lumbar lordosis, which are which were the kids that had more uh, knee extension. So, it looks like knee flexion in stance was associated with PI uh, or pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis mismatch, at least in this little cohort. Of course, we need way much more studies to uh, understand this better. But why is it important at last? Because it's been well documented that uh, SPA is directly correlated with quality of life. And this is the this is the trick. This is the way that hopefully people will start paying attention to what they're doing to the lower limbs. You know, if you have mismatch, there are plenty of papers showing that uh, typically aging patients with mismatch have a very poor quality of life. So would it be the same for patients with cerebral palsy? Well, I want to believe that patients with cerebral palsy are exactly like us. They come from the same planet, from the same galaxy. They just have stubborn legs. And I think what we need to do is to be able to get those legs straighter somehow without compromising their, their SPA, their, their spinal pelvic alignment. Every time, uh, I believe that every time that we get knees to extend at the expenses of tilting the pelvis forward, we're creating mismatch. And creating mismatch is very likely a guarantee that these patients' quality of life in the long term is going to be miserable. Of course, we need more data to understand this better. So my role at this point in time is to to spread this concept within the the you know the the gate analysts and gate uh, uh, gate orthopedic surgeons so that they think twice before uh, lengthening hamstrings and tilting the pelvis. Thank you, Duran. That's what I had to talk. Yeah, uh, I will just stop yeah, sharing. Yeah, thank you, Paolo, for a beautiful new concept. And uh, you are very right that uh, it does not give us answer, but it raises more questions. So let me uh, start with the question. I'm trying to understand your uh, new idea. So my questions may help you to get the things more, more clear. So uh, the first thing is like uh, you said that a lot of children with cerebral palsy has a mismatch. 
Now, considering that, what will be your recommendation about the hamstrings at this stage? And I'm asking this question in context of uh, Indian practice because a lot of them, they present to us late where only semi-T transfer or semi-T surgery may not correct the uh, length of hamstrings. So what is your take on that? Yeah, I know I know that question because you've asked that question to me before and I, I know that context as well. Um, look, I I think if if there is a I, I think I'm gonna repeat what Dr. Jim Gage taught me over and until the last day of my life. If there is a way you can get by without without lengthening or releasing hamstrings, that's probably uh, that's probably um, the way to go. So supracondyl extension osteotomies and and uh, and patellar tendon shortenings or ad advancement are a good way to correct uh, more severe deformities. Ideally, and I'm not running away from your question, but ideally, I think the right surgical dose for these patients is to address them early with semitendinosis transfer. And early is probably... Uh, nine or 10 years of age, because when you transfer semi-T above the knee, it continues to be spastic. And if you transfer it too tight and too soon, they get very tight and they can tilt the pelvis uh, posteriorly. So you have, when when you're transferring semi-T, you have to, if it's a young patient who's going to grow a lot, you need to transfer it in a very loose way. Don't, don't apply any tension. Even if the pelvis tilts forward a little bit transiently over time, it's going to go back to where it belongs. But back to your question, I think, I think um, when when they when they get to you in a in a more severe situation, I think I think the, 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 my dose would be a supracondylar extension osteotomy with shortening and patellar tendon. Uh, I as you know, I do patellar tendon shortening. I think PTA and PTS are similar, uh, similar in in efficacy. And uh, as everything in life, there's a role for every surgical dose. I, I I think patellar tendon advancement is probably a more powerful dose than than patellar tendon uh, shortening. Uh, when we first showed uh, patellar tendon shortening, we went to the for the tendon because that's where the money is. You know, the tendon is long, not the insertion of the tendon is not misplaced. It's the in the right position. The problem is not the tibial tuber tuberosity. The problem is the tendon. So I think I think patellar tendon shortening is a good operation, and there's papers showing that. But I that's what I would do for for the more severe cases. I would. Uh, I would go for supracondylar extension shortening uh, osteotomies and PTSs or PTAs. Okay. Uh, just the question in relation to that, uh, we have two options. The, the first is like we go for the hamstring lengthening. And in that, uh, we are not touching the bone length, but we are lengthening the muscles. The second concept which you gave, like we go for a shortening, where we shorten the femur. So we don't touch the muscle, but we shorten the femur. Have you studied the difference between the two on the pelvic tilt? Uh, not that I know of, uh, Duran. If there is one, I haven't read it. Uh, the problem, the problem with hamstrings, the uh, my 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 view of the problem of hamstrings lengthenings is that you never know what's been done. Okay. The cases that I that I've seen over my lifetime, in Australia we didn't see many because you know there there was a small group of uh, surgeons doing these operations and and everybody were uh, sort of on the same boat, but here in the United States and back in Brazil I saw that the first thing that people do is to release semi T. Uh, you know whenever there is a patient with with previous hamstrings lengthenings, I try to palpate semi-T and I can't find it because it's easy to release. It's like the Achilles tendon. You know, you just go through the, you, you, you go through, uh, through the skin and you, you cut it. So, and then what do you do really, or what do people really do to the other muscles? They, they're called hamstrings lengthenings, 
or releases or a mixed, but you, you never know what really was the technique. You know, did they cut semimember noses? Did they cut uh, biceps or did they lengthen it intramuscularly? Uh, so that that is the problem. That's why uh, I, I and 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 we know there there are at least a couple of papers uh, from the past one uh, showing that in two thirds of patients with crouch the hamstrings are actually not short. They they are they are the normal length and and some of them are actually longer than they should be because the pelvis is tilted forward. So uh, to me, lengthening hamstrings is not is not the, the solution to the problem. It, 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 it looks like it is, but also flexed knee gait is due to a multitude of factors. You know, people don't, in, uh, every time people look at flexed knee gait, the first thing that they think is, oh, the hamstrings are short. To me, that's the last thing that I'm going to think. You know, I'm going to look at the levers. I'm going to look at the the length of the 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 plantar flexors. I'm going to is there a hip flexion deformity? Is is there excessive femoral torsion, external tibial torsion, plantar valgus foot? Well, how is the balance? Uh, how is the vision? Uh, how is everything else? But people just go for the hamstrings, and and uh, and and I. I uh, hopefully we're going to have some data published soon showing that once you lengthen the hamstrings and the pelvis tilts forward, it looks like in adults, uh, it doesn't go away. It stays there. Well, if you tilt the pelvis, you increase lower doses. If you increase lower doses, it's very likely that you're going to have mismatch because pelvic incidence doesn't change. And a, a certain pelvic incidence only tolerates a certain amount of lordosis. The minute the pelvis tilts and, and lordosis above increases, it's likely that you're going to create mismatch. So I think, uh, you know, in life, uh, in my professional life, I try to do everything that I could not to lengthen the hamstrings. But trust me, I started uh, lengthening hamstrings. Uh, then, uh, we, but I, I was lucky because I was a fellow when Dr. Uh, Dr. Jim Gage taught me semi-T transfer. So I, the, the minute I started my practice, I started transferring semi-T, lengthening semi-member noses. But then I, then, then I realized that when I lengthened semi-member noses, the pelvis was still tilting forward. So then, then I stopped lengthening semi-member noses. And then there's a paper from Scott Delp that shows that semi-member noses is very, uh, very sensitive to lengthening, just like solus. Semi-member noses is the solus of the, the thigh. And, uh, and when you touch it, it, it loses power. So then I stopped doing that. And thank God, uh, anterior hemiopyphysial disease was starting with the eight plates. I said, oh, that's it. I'm going to do semi-T first or together, depending on the age of the patient. And uh, I'm going to do the anterior hemiopyphysial disease. Hopefully that will be enough. But then if, if it's not enough, I still have the supracondylar extension osteotomy and PTS and C. And I left all the hamstrings alone. Uh, I must say, though, that there have been about 10 patients in my career that I found that biceps femoris, uh, the long head, which is biarticular, not the short head. The short head is, is monoarticular, therefore shouldn't be lengthened, I think. But I found a couple of patients that the, the biceps were so tight that I did a fasciotomy around the biceps. But don't tell anyone, I've done it very secretly and uh, probably no more than 10 patients in 30 years. Okay, uh, then there is a question about at what minimal age where anterior distal femur physiodesis by PET can be done without damaging the physis. So like uh, to that question, uh, I would like to add, do you go for eight plate or you go for uh, the PET? Because Tom Nowacek has recently a video published in J. Pozna, a journal of Pozna, where they have shown that uh, they do it with PET for the distal femur. Yeah, look, we started with the eight plates, uh, the good old eight plates, the first ones. They were thick and bulky and they produced a lot of pain. Then uh, we we stopped because we had some patients that couldn't tolerate the plates anteriorly in the knee. Then the, the new plates 
from another industry came and they were slimmer and we started using them again and the results were better. Uh, and recently I've, I've done a few, a couple actually, with uh, a cannulated screws. The problem with cannulated screws is that it tends to, it seems to work faster. It starts working immediately, but it's, it's, it's hard to remove them. And uh, just about two or three weeks ago, I treated uh, a kid that was treated in, in a major center here in the United States with uh, with can anterior cannulated screws. And the kid developed severe varus of one knee and, and mild valgus, valgus of the other knee. So I had to remove the screws and put an eight plate on the varus uh, side to see if we can fix it. I, I'm, uh, you know, the older you become, the, 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 the more frightened you become. I, I don't like poking my nose in, uh, in young growth plates. I think a good time to start thinking about them is probably 11 or 12. Uh, whilst you can do, you know, you can do a semi-T transfer very safely uh, around the, the age of 10 or 11. So I, I, I always do the semi-T transfer first and then later on uh, the, the epiphyseal disease if necessary. And when they come to you and they're 12 or 13, so there's not a lot of time for epiphyseal disease, then I do them together, you know, the semi-T transfer and the epiphyseal disease at the same time. Uh, yeah, Thomas has a question. Thomas, please. Hi, Paulo. Nice to hear from you. See you after a long time. You look a little Good different. Good to see you. Too. Good yeah. to see you. So just as we are trying to wrap our head around uh, the complex gait analysis, and you you taught Abe the semi T transfer. We do that back in Vellor in CMC where you came in 2018, and now this concept of uh, pelvic incidence and spinopelvic mobility. It's sort of little uh, difficult for us to wrap our head against uh, to a to a superior meaning a, a thing higher than the hip. We only used to seeing the gait and everything up from the ankle, the knee, and the hip. For us, this is an entirely new concept. Uh, so when we are just about so what you said, if I can recollect, is that uh, a spastic diplegia who has a crouched knee has a lot more mismatch with the pelvic incidence and the palamba londosis and this gait becomes efficient or inefficient. Is, is, is that what you're trying to say? No, I, t I said the opposite, actually. Uh, we In that little cohort that we, we studied preliminarily, yeah. the patients that had had surgery to extend the knee and they extended the knee, the pelvis tilted forward and they had mismatch. Okay. Okay. The patients who had surgeries or whatever, but they didn't extend the knee so much, the pelvis didn't didn't tilt so much, so they did not have mismatch. Mismatch, okay. So in those two cohorts, okay. the patients that had more knee flexion okay. didn't have mismatch. The patients okay. that had uh, 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 full knee extension had mismatch. So when we present this at the, I think it was the um, the Gate Society here uh, in America, uh, Dr. Freeman Miller was there and he said, well, what are we going to do now? We're going to leave them flexed knee, but flexed knee gait is pretty bad. And I, I agree, we need to fix the flexed knee, flex knee gait. I think what this concept adds to us or emphasizes you know i'll tell you the story tom uh i don't know perhaps seven or eight years ago i was at one american academy of cerebral palsy and they had no or, or pausen and they had the specialty day of cp and this group of some part in the united states presented yet another yet another paper showing that hamstrings lengthenings do stretch the knees Okay. And we know there's probably a hundred papers out there showing that when you lengthen or release the hamstrings, uh, the knees stretch. Sometimes they overstretch and go into hyperextension, which is pathetic. But we know that when you take the hamstrings, they very often extend the knee. And I noticed, and the the, the lady who was presenting, uh, she's I saw I saw the kinematics, and the pelvis had tilted 15 degrees from normal. And of course, I stood up and I said, well, what about the pelvis? The pelvis tilted forward. Does it, does it matter? And her reply marked me. She said, 
yeah, it tilted, but we don't know what that means. Well, now we know. Okay, that was my quest. I said, there's got to be, because instinctively to me, walking with 30 degrees of anterior pelvic tilt cannot be right. Mm -hmm. If most of us, if not all of us, walks with 5 or 10 degrees. So when I looked at the pelvis, and, and, and Dr. Jim Gage instinctively knew that already because he was uh, you know, so far ahead of his time, you know, he taught me that in 1995. So he already knew that tilting the pelvis was not good. Okay. So my task became then, okay, I need to show why it's not good. When this, when this lady told me, but we don't know what, what that means. Okay. I said, well, I, I have to understand what it means. And SPA is the answer to it. You know, when you have mismatch, uh, you, your quality of life is going to be really, really bad. It's going to happen to you as well if you have a spinal deformity or something that changes that 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 relationship. Okay. And as we age, we lose lumbar lordosis and our pelvis tilts full, uh, tilts backwards. And you saw the picture. We need to flex our knees. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm trying to do with this concept, and it's, it's new for us, Thomas, but yeah. it's not new for the spine surgeons. They've known about this for at least 30 or 40 years. Every time they fuse a spine, they, they want to do uh, the, the lumbar lordosis perfectly. And this is just the beginning of the, the, the iceberg. One of the reviewers of an, our paper said, well, but you just meant, uh, you just studied that. What about this and that and the other? And I said, well, uh, it's it, it's just the beginning. We're we're gate analysts. We treat legs. The, give me a break. Let me start to understand how yeah. this is applied in in cerebral palsy. Okay. And uh, so I think what I intend with this is that people say, okay, when somebody says to you, well, the pelvis tilted forward, but what does it mean? Well, what it means is that the spinal pelvic alignment is probably compromised and that certainly will uh impact on this person's quality of life uh yeah. in the long term now it could be also we've seen that there are uh, there are patients with cerebral palsy who have not had hamstring surgeries or flexed knee gait and they're already presenting with uh, a spinal uh, spa uh, misalignment and mismatch we don't know because it's it has not been studied yet in 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 ambulatory CP. So it's just what I want is people to start paying attention to that and do more studies and and yeah. go ahead and publish. Yeah. But you've, you've started with the soleus, you went to the hamstrings. Now you go to the spine. Very soon you'll be at the brain, I suppose. <laughs> hopefully, I'll be dead. <laughs> hopefully I'll be dead by then. <laughs> Okay, nice, nice yeah. hearing from yourself, Paolo. Yeah, Paolo, I have a question. Like a lot of children, not not uh, the one whom we have operated, but a young children, when we give them a uh, elbow crutches, they lean forward, like something what you showed in your picture following the hamstring surgery. But without hamstring surgery, they lean forward. So what could be the reason for that? And some people, they say that they give a posterior or the K walker, and that may probably avoid such uh, falling forward gait. So, what is your take on that? Well, I I I haven't seen any patients in my lifetime that have strong glutei and strong uh, hamstrings to begin with. If you if you put all of your patients with CP in prone and you ask them to extend the hips, you see that they struggle or they can't do it. If you ask them to to bend their knees. Even the, you know, if they're GMFSS three, even those who haven't had hamstrings lengthenings or releases, they have a hard time flexing the the, the knees against the gravity. So you, so uh, CP uh, CP muscles are uh, are by definition weaker than typically uh, developing kids. And I think it was uh, Dr. Diane Damiano who published a paper a long time ago showing that. And so there, the I, I think when the GMFs has threes when they tilt forward with the walker, uh, it's probably a uh, it's probably a lot a multitude of factors. You know, again, it's equilibrium, selective motor control, vision, balance, weakness or strength, 
liver arm dysfunction, you know, all of that. So you need, you know, each each one of these patients you need to, that's why gait analysis is so uh, important in my opinion, because when you have gait analysis, it gives you another layer of insight as to, okay, what's, what's really happening here? I mean, gait analysis is not everything. Uh, when I when I first started using gait analysis, I thought uh, in a very naive way that I was going to fix every gait in the world, and it never happened. Probably uh, it's the same feeling when you started doing Ponsetti technique, and I did that as well many years ago. And I said, now I'm going to treat all the club feet in the world, and they're going to be all perfect. And you know that it's not quite like that. Paolo, for ex definitely we will be more watchful when we treat the next patient uh, and think about the hamstring surgery uh, because your lecture will remind us not to disturb the spinopelvic alignment. So thank you once again for making us aware about this concept. And as I uh, agree with uh, Thomas that yes, when we look at the gait visually because I, I don't have a computer gait analysis or the 3D gait analysis. So most of the time we focus on knee and the ankle. To some extent, we can see <coughs> a hip joint, but the pelvis is absolutely obscure and we, we don't understand what is happening to that. So yes, uh, if we have gait analysis with us in all the patient, then probably we will have a more uh, clarity like you have. So thank you once again for uh, your uh, spelling time for us and making us aware about the new concept. Well, thank, thank you, you for the opportunity, uh, Jaren. I really appreciate the opportunity. Please spread it. And for those of you who have the ability to do research, um, EOS, I don't know how popular EOS is in India, but EOS is a is a very, very useful tool. It allows us to to take you know the the full body uh, radiograph and you can measure everything and it's low radiation. So I now call it when I when I write a request for EOS, I say spine surveillance, hip surveillance, lower limb surveillance. So it's not only hip surveillance that you have to do, you have to do surveillance of the spine, the pelvis, the hips, and the lower limbs. Thank you so much. Yeah, and then there is a question by Professor Alok Sood. And the question is like, if this SPA is disturbed or it has resulted into malalignment, do we have anything to offer? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think we'll have to talk to the spine surgeons. Uh, I, I've already seen adults requiring lumbar uh, sacral uh, fusions because they have so much back pain. No wonder 60% of the adult, 50 to 60% of the adults with CP have back pain. I wonder why. Uh, and, uh, and it's one of the most common causes of pain in, in, in adults with cerebral palsy. I, I've seen at least two or three that required fusions because the, the pain was so severe and the, the lordosis was so uh, so severe. But it's if we could prevent that, if we could treat the legs a little bit better and try to prevent that is what I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand if it's going to make a difference. Like we do the distal femoral extension osteotomy. Can we do a proximal femoral extension osteotomy to correct it? Just, Look, just we... a crazy idea. No, no, no. We in in younger children, uh, we did it and we do it all the time. The problem is you, you can only extend a few degrees, and if they're older, I think you're risking creating impingement, uh, anterior impingement. So you can't do it in in adults or in in adolescents who are not remodeling anymore. Uh, back in Melbourne, we did. Um, uh, I I use I more often than not used to do derotation, uh, derotation and extend the femur five degrees or thereabouts. We know that when we untwist the femur above the lacer trochanter, we re we relax iliopsoas as well. That's why when I see people who say they 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 know CP and they do below the lacer trochanter derotation osteotomies, I know that they don't quite understand very much. The, you know, derotation osteotomies of the femur needs to be above the lacer trochanter to relax the the the, the psoas. 
And uh, but you can extend it uh, as well a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, I've always used the little blade plate, which is my friend forever, and it works just fine. Okay, and then there is a question uh, again, like does uh, anterior hip muscles release something like a psoas or the uh, the rectus? Does that help in reducing this problem? Uh, no, I don't think so. When the when you've lost your hamstrings, uh, uh, you uh, you can't. I in adults, and this is another on one of my little secrets that I haven't published. Hopefully, one day I'll publish. But in adults, I don't do rectus transfers. I do proximal rectus releases uh, in stiff knee gait because it's it's easier for them to recover and. And it, I, I suspect that it doesn't. They don't waste so much extensor power when you release it proximally. And what I've seen in post-op uh, gait analysis is I've seen a couple of patients where the pelvis tilted back like three degrees, five degrees, with you know trying to be an optimist. But you know, lengthening muscles don't make them push the pelvis backwards. Uh, you know, muscles can't push; they can only pull. And it's the it's the muscles in the back that that hold the pelvis in a good position. If you lose them, uh, if you lose the hamstrings and the glutei, as we said in CP, are, are weak by definition. Uh, you don't you, your glutei are bad, and then you lose your hamstrings. Once the pelvis tilts forward, it's it's uh, irreparable. I don't think we can fix that, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I mean, in children, in children. I've seen a few children where uh, as they grew, hopefully the, the the hamstrings tighten up again. And look at what I'm saying. Hopefully the, the hamstrings tighten up again and, and, and the pelvis, I've seen a few that the pelvis over time tilted backwards a little bit. But uh, uh, those percutaneous lengthenings that people do nowadays where they cut everything without control, though, those are the worst. And we see the long-term results for that. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to repair those kids. Yeah, and there is a last question. We will take it up from Professor Amancio. Uh, is the iliopsoas contracture relevant uh, for spinopelvic alignment? Can you repeat the question? The iliopsoas is relevant or responsible for the SPA malalignment? Amongst you, I that's a very good question. I, 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 it must be logically, but the problem is that we know that so as lengthening over or at the brim in children is somewhat uh, efficacious, but in adults it doesn't do anything. Uh, I and I tried to lengthen the so as in adults, and the pelvis doesn't budge, doesn't move. It, uh, I. Uh, of course, if you have a, a hip flexion contracture, uh, it's going to prevent the pelvis from tilting po uh, posteriorly. But lengthening lengthening psoas, if you don't have anything to pull in the back, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Uh, so that's why w once these kids have had hamstrings lengthenings, uh, I, I, it's hard to, to, to fix. It's like the TAL. Once you lengthen the Achilles tendon, it's for life. I see them at the age of 40 and they still don't have plantar flexors. Uh, you, you run them through the gate lab at the age of 40, 50, and they, you see the, the, the ankle dorsiflexion uh, um, plot. They, 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 there's no break. Solus is no longer there. You, you don't see that, that difference in speed, in speed, in angular velocity. It's just like a, 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 a heel up. They go straight into dorsiflexion. I think I think that's what happens with the hamstrings. When you touch them, you lose them, and you lose your patient as well. Yeah, Paolo, I would like to uh, end the talk or uh, end the session with a compliment. I always believe that good teacher don't answer questions, but he makes a lot of questions in the mind of uh, students, and. This is what you have done today. You have raised a lot of questions in our mind. And I'm sure that this ignition will definitely help us to find out the solution to this, this difficult problem. Thank you once again.
thank also you say, also say hi to uh, one of our famous indians the ranavat is a he's a legend in these parts HSS. i didn't know he had moved to hss from colombia so i just yeah. saw your background and realized you're the hss so ranavat is a real household name in india because he pioneered hepatroplasty he keeps coming to india very often and we have a lot of people who've trained under ranavat fantastic Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You're you're all my friends and brothers for for a long yeah. time now and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.